Welcome, everybody. It's really a pleasure to welcome you to our fireside chat. It's October, and even though uh, David O'Danes and I are, are, are speaking to you from Niagara, Canada, we don't actually need fires at this time of year, but you can imagine we'll live our stereotype a little bit and uh, assume that this is a, a lovely fireside chat. I'm very excited to introduce David Adames to you because he is the CEO of one of the world's biggest government operated attractions, namely Niagara Falls. And what's interesting about Niagara Falls is, of course, it was there for hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years. It's a geological feature, it was enjoyed and respected by indigenous people tens of thousands of years ago. But by around 1887, government got into the act. And that's why this topic is very fitting for uh, creative bureaucracy. So, David, can you tell people a little bit about what it's like to be CEO of this amazing attraction? Well, thank you, Gail, for the kind introduction. And it, it's an honor uh, to be the CEO uh, of the Niagara Parks Commission. And as you mentioned, uh, there were visionaries uh, with the provincial government. So the province of Ontario, one of the provinces in, in Canada, uh, established what became the the full Niagara Parks Commission a few years later, but back in the 1880s, they wanted to protect the land around the iconic uh, Horseshoe Falls, Niagara Falls, and also the land that also sees the American Falls. And I think on the first uh, picture that we'll bring up, uh, it is that iconic image of the Horseshoe Falls. So originally, uh, that was Niagara Parks. It was to protect that area around the falls. Over time, our mandate has expanded to cover the entire Niagara River corridor from the town of Fort Erie, which borders uh, Buffalo, New York, right up to Niagara on the lake. Uh, so it, it's, it is a 56 kilometer Niagara River corridor, and we are the environmental and cultural stewards of that land. Great. Well, let's start looking at some put some photographs so that we can see one now, I think, on on people's right or left, depending on which way they look. Can you just tell us a bit about each one, David? Yeah, so so the first image uh, has the, the Horseshoe Falls, so the upper Niagara River uh, on the upper part of the photo. Uh, that's, of course, heading south. Uh, the river flows uh, from Lake Erie uh, to Lake Ontario, so part of the Great Lakes system. So it flows from the south to the north. And uh, in the image on the right-hand side or the, the west side of the photo, uh, we have our uh, key um, building facility called Table Rock, and actually the name came from an original uh, Table Rock that went over uh, the edge of the, the Horseshoe Falls, and inside we operate uh, guest experiences. So a journey behind the falls where guests go down an elevator and out to a viewing platform where they stand right next to the roaring Horseshoe Falls and to, and to stand there and, and feel the power of the falls, of course, you get covered in mist as well, which is part of the experience. And uh, we have a, a wonderful restaurant and, and retail store in that location. But the point being that there is that uh, government run uh, revenue producing operation located at this world icon, I mean, the Horseshoe Falls. So that's what you're seeing in that image. And just in the upper right of it, you're seeing uh, uh, a decommissioned hydroelectric power generating plant that you see in the backdrop of my photo. We're going to talk a bit about that later. Fantastic. Now, the next slide, I think, gets you that, if I remember, pretty close to the falls. There we go. Yes. Are. So this image here on the right hand side. Uh, so Niagara Parks, we actually have three decommissioned hydroelectric power generating plants. This is uh, the, the second one uh, in our collection. And in the image on the left hand side, you see Hornblower Niagara Cruise is operating their boat tour experience in the Niagara Basin. It's a it's an experience that's been running uh, in the Niagara Basin since the uh, 1840s, uh, if you can imagine. But this is one of those, and I, I've used the word iconic before, but it is an iconic attraction for Canada, the boat tour at Niagara Falls. Uh, so the operator today is um, uh, Niagara City Cruises or, or Hornblower Cruises. They operate that boat experience, and that's what you're seeing in that image. Right. And I think it's some incredible number of jobs that you generate, 40,000. And also, of course, this is a power generation, clean power, namely hydropower. So let's look at the next one. I think the next one is also pretty iconic. <laughs> oh, my God. There's an icon. 
<laughs> so Marilyn Monroe, and, and over the years, uh, and you've mentioned that uh, the Niagara Corridor, including the falls, have been enjoyed by Indigenous peoples. Uh, that dates back, we know for sure, at least 13,000 years. Uh, but in the 19th century, in the 20th century, now in the 21st century, we have many visitors who come, some very famous like Marilyn Monroe, and there have been films uh, shot at Niagara Falls. So Marilyn Monroe, the film Niagara in 1955, uh, there she is, uh, just, this was just north of the uh, Horseshoe Falls where this uh, scene was recorded. But you know that uh, Superman 2 was shot uh, in Niagara Falls, uh, that was around about 1980. But again, over the years, many famous people have visited uh, from uh, you know Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, and I could name many, many others. Fantastic, and let's see the next slide. So this image here, uh, we're very proud of our relationship uh, with um, the U.S. side, the United States side. So you can imagine we're in the Niagara River corridor, we're on the Canadian side. We again look after um, the uh, land along the Canadian side of the Niagara River. Then we have our friends on the U.S. side. And since 1925, jointly or collaboratively, we've been lighting up the falls and we've been changing the technology over the years. So what you're seeing in this image is our nightly, so every night, 365 days every year, we illuminate both the Horseshoe Falls and the American Falls. So back in 2015-16, we worked together uh, with the uh, the U.S. side to uh, redo the lights. We uh, did an LED lighting technology, and you imagine we're shooting lights 1,600 feet uh, from an illumination tower to hit the Horseshoe Falls. And then we have uh, illumination going about 800 to 1,000 feet on the American Falls through mist conditions. You can see in this image here where, where you can see mist. So we have to get light through that mist. So it was a wonderful project, a $4 million Canadian funds uh, to redo the lights, $2 million from the US side, $2 million from the Canadian side, half public, half private. Um, so we have six organizations, three on the Canadian side, three on the U.S. side that work together on the Niagara Falls Illumination Board. And right now I, I, uh, I'm very proud to be the chair of the board, uh, but it's something that we light up the falls for special occasions. Uh, that could be uh, a special uh, anniversary globally. It could be the death of a, of a high profile individual. Uh, for example, when Nel Nelson Mandela passed, we lit the falls in his honor. So it's something that is covered uh, na nationally and globally uh, when we do those special illuminations of the falls. And I think the next one is so magnificent. We just have to show it and then we'll kind of get into cultural diplomacy in a sec. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So here and now with the LED lighting technology, we can light any uh, or use any light of the spectrum. Uh, so this is a rainbow image on the falls and we try and, and illuminate the falls respecting nature. So colors by nature. So we do things like a rainbow and no, on most days there's a rainbow in the afternoon over the Horseshoe Falls. But we do things like an Aurora Borealis, a sunrise, a sunset. Uh, so it is colors by nature to honor the integrity of this uh, globally known address. So David, thanks so much. That that just gives people a feeling about it, and hopefully they'll come visit when COVID allows people to visit places again, and and so on. Um, I wonder if you could talk about a little bit as we as we as we move on, because it's one of the themes of this conference, which is how do you actually engage communities? So there's this huge global attraction, roughly 13 million visitors a year, give or take a few, in uh, a non-COVID year. But I was really intrigued by the story of what you did in collaboration with the parking attendants when you had this uh, the situation of massive unemployment this year because of COVID. Could you talk about that a bit? Yes, so we had, much like many um, tourism locations around the world, you know, high growth in tourism in, in 2017, 2018, 2019, and then COVID happened in March of 2020. And for, for Niagara Parks, uh, government agency, yes, but we don't receive any tax dollars. So we generate our revenue from our revenue producing operations. So we operate at, at attractions, retail stores, golf courses, heritage sites, parking services. Of course, we have our, our tenants like Hornblower uh, operating the boat tour. So we get a, a rent uh, from that operation, a zipline attraction operator. But the point being, we had this height of, uh, of tourism. Uh, we had 1,800 people employed uh, in 2019. Then all of a sudden our doors were closed. Again, much like many tourism locations around the world. So we had to manage our workforce uh, in a new way. So we redeployed uh, many staff to work on projects like the um, 
the adaptive reuse of the Niagara Parks Power Station, which we'll talk a bit, a bit, a bit about later. But again, finding opportunities for our staff and for many, they've been with us for uh, uh, years, uh, the multi-generations of families that work for Niagara Parks. So that wasn't lost on me as a CEO in terms of the importance of corporate culture. Uh, the, uh, the their dedication to Niagara Parks, their dedication to the tourism industry. So going through that COVID period, corporate culture and our workforce adjustment plan was something that we talked a lot about with our board of directors and our senior management team to make sure that we are treating our staff respectfully and looking for opportunities for them. Right. So I heard a story, which was that you actually, for, for the parking attendants, because uh, parking was a huge revenue, b a lot of people yeah. because many people come by car, that they actually were redeployed. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the power station that's right behind you now. Yes. How did you redeploy parking attendants? I think that that's, <laughs> and that had a powerful effect on the community. No, it, it sure did. So uh, the parking attendants were one example where we now have some of, uh, of our park, former parking attendants working as, as guides in the uh, power station. We also redeployed our, uh, our bus transportation mechanics uh, and uh, uh, folks who worked in our uh, engineering trades to work at the power station during what I call the off season. So again, during this COVID period. And so we had, from a business need perspective, we had to get uh, the power station ready now as an attraction. So there's lots of work to be done, but it was using people's skills in a bit of a different way. Uh, so we were able to keep more people working uh, during that time period. And the parking attendants being a really good example. Uh, so now we have great, uh, a great staff team at the power station. We're now open to the public uh, with that new attraction. That's fantastic. Um, and, and just moving back to the subject you touched on a little bit before, which is kind of public diplomacy. You're a public servant. And again, I want to always keep coming back to this, this theme of creative bureaucracy, right? Which uh, people, you're a public servant, but yet you must be dragged into all kinds of, of di diplomatic engagement. How, how do you manage that? Yes. So, as I said earlier, we are a provincial agency. So again, looking after the, the land mass that goes along 56 kilometers. So we work with four municipalities or four towns and cities, the town of Fort Erie, town of Niagara-on-the-Lake, city of Niagara Falls, and what's called an upper tier municipality, the region of Niagara. So there are, are many initiatives that we work on together. Probably the city of Niagara Falls is a great example where we operate, uh, jointly operate a, uh, transport a visitor transportation system. We've done that for many years successfully. That's to move visitors through the tourist areas in the city down into Niagara Parks. We also operate public programming uh, like uh, Canada's uh, only nationally broadcast New Year's Eve celebration, so a cultural celebration. Those are two examples uh, where we do work with the, uh, the city of Niagara Falls. We've also brought other um, iconic events uh, to the destination. So uh, we also operate um, uh, trail systems together. Uh, so trails are a great linkage. And in addition to the municipalities, we work with tourism stakeholders. So what we call business improvement associations, uh, particularly again in, in the city of Niagara Falls, where we may again be looking at uh, programming, uh, other business development opportunities. So although, again, we're the environmental and cultural stewards of this of this land area stretching that, that uh, Niagara River corridor, we're very mindful of our role to support tourism in Niagara and working with tourism stakeholders is very important. So packaging uh, visitor experiences, a visitor transportation system, and looking after public safety with our Niagara Parks Police Service, working in conjunction with the Niagara Region Police Service as well. So one of the things I was thinking about was, again, I've been visiting Niagara Falls since childhood. I think people know I'm a Canadian and now I live near the falls. And by the way, there is every day that there is sun, there is a rainbow. It's a, a natural, real <laughs> rainbow. It's just utterly incredible. Um, I think that uh, on one hand, you have this attraction, this natural attraction that seems to be immutable and unchanging. But in fact, change management is really one of the hallmarks of your of your of your job. And um, I wanted to just spend really the, the bulk of our conversation on why change matters. You have mm. what are the kinds of changes you see? I guess the way I would put it is the falls are always there, but the people are always changing. Communities are always changing. So what's been your philosophy and approach to change management? Uh, it, it's a great question, and and you know tourism 
continues to evolve. So whether it's um, the expectations of our customers or the visitors, you know, tourism has grown globally, as you as you know. So destinations that uh, formerly weren't open, whether it be 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or certainly 30 years ago, are now available. So there's a competition factor. And we look at competition, you know that we have to meet visitors' expectations. So it almost goes back to the four P's of marketing, right? So you have to understand uh, understand your market and their expectations. So I think tourism has changed from transactional to more immersive and, and, and engagement. So people want to get something from their uh, travel, their, their trip to take back, whether it's uh, to uh, feel more enriched or to share with their friends and family. Uh, so that I think it's it's definitely changed that way. And for us as Niagara Parks, with our core mandate as the an environmental stewards of the corridor, it ties in very well because I think people are looking at not only sustainable tourism, but a way to make that that destination even better for having visited. So we're going to be expanding some programming in that space. But, you know, look at change management. We talked earlier about I mean, per perhaps some of our staff team members doing work differently now. Uh, so they used to be, say, an example of the, of the parking attendant now working directly in the power station, providing a different guest experience. So how do we change from uh, job function? How do we change our back end systems? You know, we introduced a new ticketing system for our attractions uh, just a, a couple of years ago. We brought in a guest services center to look after all of our visitor touch points. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we introduced a new ERP for our finance system. We replaced a 20 year old finance system. We went live with that April the 1st this uh, this past year. So moving from old systems to new systems, that's change management. Opening new guest experiences, that's change management. Uh, so one thing that we did about two years ago, pre COVID, uh, knowing that we had some big projects coming up, that we had changing expectations from our guests, and also knowing that we needed to do succession planning, uh, I set up a leadership roundtable with a cohort of staff, about 30 individuals, whom we see as leaders today in the organization, but potentially could step up to that next level down the road. So we looked at leadership competencies uh, through case study work. We met for about four, almost five months, but they had a capstone project. And that was to look at the adaptive reuse of the Niagara Parks Power Station. Each of the groups, they, they went from 30 down to uh, uh, five groups of six individuals. They took a topic uh, related to the power station from a leadership perspective and then presented both a written and verbal report uh, to the senior team afterwards. But that was one way of helping with change management as well. And the last point I want to say too is we uh, we put a group of about 30 staff as well uh, through a change management certification program. We took uh, the ProSci program and uh, we certified, including me. Uh, so I went through the certification as well. And uh, I certainly approach some of these core projects now differently having had that change management uh, certification. Wow, that's okay. So now let's unveil. Uh, tomorrow night is actually going to be the big unveiling of what's behind you. So can you just explain to people what they've been looking at? I've been there. It's just amazing. <laughs> yes. So I want uh, you know the the uh, festival delegates to think about that the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century, and there was something new, certainly emerging in North America, called hydroelectric power generation, and there were innovators like. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse and many others, and they were trying to harness um, a, what was you know, really green energy. And so in the Niagara corridor, they wanted to harness the power of the Niagara River and the elevation drop that uh, resulted from Niagara Falls. So there was this competition to build hydroelectric power plants, uh, again, late, late 1890s into the very early uh, years of the 20th century. So the power station that you see is my backdrop, and we might be able to change the photo on the screen as well, is what we call now the Niagara Parks Power Station. Uh, we, Niagara Parks, uh, we were the general contractor to turn this into a new attraction. So we developed a strategic conservation plan that honored the heritage features of the building, and that really informed how we went about uh, the construction side. We worked with um, uh, another company to develop an attraction master plan. We also worked with another company, Gail, that you'll be very familiar with, to develop an interpretation plan to look at the major themes. So it was Lord Cultural Resources, obviously, for that for that uh, interpretation plan that looked at themes to develop that immersive guest experience. So uh, our daytime experience opened, and to your point, we're unveiling the evening experience uh, on uh, on September third. It's really great. And uh, I think that people can see behind you. I, I, I know it's officially called a, a power 
station, but I think that people are really already calling it the Palace of Power because it is <laughs> so beautiful in, in, in every respect. And it's got interactive technology and many other aspects. What, what, do you, what, what I'm seeing is that this is a, a kind of a transformation in part from an attraction that was a thrill attraction. I mean, after all, it was a story of people going over the falls in a barrel. I mean, Marilyn Monroe is really part of the thrill attraction aspect of it going back into uh, the 1950s. And now I, I, I see a movement in the attraction sector um, more towards balancing with heritage and environment. So it, it seems like a societal change is happening. Do, do you want to, is, is that just me uh, being a wishful thinker, which I, of course I am? No, I, I think you're you're on to it. I, but, but having said that, I think we as as leaders need to be deliberate about how we develop an attraction like the Niagara Parks Power Station to pick up on that on that trend that we're seeing in society and then how we share that story and engage our guests. So I don't, I, you know, it, it could potentially happen organically, but I think in many ways we do need to be uh, uh, deliberate with that. I will share uh, with you in the in the audience today that of all the projects that I've been involved with at Niagara Parks, I've, I've been there eight, uh, a little over eight years. Universally, the adaptive reuse of the Niagara Parks power station has been received so positively. In fact, I've not had one negative comment about that. And typically when you do a project, you get some, some naysayers, some feedback, but I think why this has resonated uh, with folks is it ties directly to our mandate. So, you know, uh, repurposing or doing adaptive reuse of a heritage structure like this power station ties into our mandate. There's been this curiosity factor of people seeing this building uh, for many decades. Uh, so it's been there, it was constructed between 1901, 1905, very much an industrial purpose to generate power, but it's been closed since 2006. So now it, it's an opportunity to open it to the public uh, forever. And, and, and it's back in the public realm, this is a public asset and it'll be there to be enjoyed uh, for generations. And hydroelectric power generation is a huge part of Niagara's history and it's part of our future. So there's a modern plant, uh, although um, <laughs> built initially back in the 1920s and expanded up on the north part of the Niagara Parkway. So we're still harnessing the power of the river and of the falls, uh, but at a, at a newer plant uh, on the North Parkway. So this station that you, again, with the backdrop that you see, it is the last of its kind left intact. Uh, so all of the um, infrastructure was left intact, thank goodness, so that we can uh, tell the story, engage our guests. So to your point, yes, visitors are looking for that cultural experience. They're looking for that enriching experience. They want to learn something. And for us as well, because this has so much science, technology, engineering, and math or STEM, that we're hoping that we can turn on that next generation of uh, of engineers, of technologists uh, to uh, um, for, for future careers as well. That's 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 really fantastic. Now, of course, it wouldn't be Niagara Parks Commission if there wasn't a thrill element. I mean, you know, we can be very lofty about it. And I know, well, tomorrow night we're going to be able to see it and it opens officially to the public on the 3rd. Can you talk about why you decided to do a nighttime aspect? And maybe we'll show our two closing slides now. Um, the first one just gives you an idea of the entrance and the second one gives you an idea of the experience. Sure. So we can turn to. So here's the uh, the generator hall floor. Uh, we've added uh, uh, interpretive panels and uh, some in, uh, some interactive exhibits as well into this. We worked with one of our other public agencies called Science North. They have a, a deep expertise in science centers. Uh, so they created the model that you're seeing on the right hand side. So that's the first model that visitors interact with to understand how the power station worked. And there's so much underground infrastructure. So the and and again, there's both guided tours and self-guided tours of the power station with many interactive elements uh, throughout. So the more thrill experiences, yes, is the evening. So the next uh, image, the next picture, will show uh, the audience that we're adding in what is an immersive uh, using reactive technology, an immersive sound and light show, and it really brings the power station to life at night. So from a tourism perspective, this was about. Yes, offering a different guest experience in the power station, but also extending the visitor's stay in the destination. It's so hopefully encouraging overnight stays or that we, we can bundle it with other experiences at Niagara Parks, whether it's dining at one of our restaurants, a uh, shopping experience, maybe uh, going to our golf courses as well as another guest experience. But, but, but bottom line is extending the tourism experience. And in 2022, 
we're going to open the underground tail race experience. So using an elevator to take guests down uh, almost 180 feet down into uh, the former tail race where the water exited the power station and walking 2,000 feet out to a viewing portal to see the lower Niagara River. So that's going to be another, uh, you get both a thrill experience, but also a very engaging, very rich experience underground. That's good. So I think we've established a new concept. This is kind of the intersection of thrill and heritage. So we have one minute left, and I'm going to put you on the spot, David, and say, if there are, I think that a lot of the people watching are going to be, you know, government public servants. What advice do you have? How do you keep your creative edge when you're always reporting up, working down? Like, how, how do you keep a creative edge? I think that that's, that's the question of the conference. Well, first of all, always remember to to uh, rely on your team, you know, surround yourself with the best people. I always like to hire smarter people uh, than me. Uh, so we had a tremendous team work on this particular project, the power station, but we've, we've done other projects in my eight years as well. Uh, and it, it is that that team concept. I take political leadership, you know, our, our minister. Uh, so we're, we're again, uh, an agency of the Ontario government. So our minister was very supportive of this adaptive reuse of the power station to create a new attraction. We had alignment with our board chair and board. So from a governance perspective, important to have that alignment. And last but not least, it was your point about how this, I mean, it's about benchmarking internationally. So we have this international destination called Niagara Falls. What are others doing around the world? So, so being uh, uh, re reinvigorated by looking at those benchmarks. Wow, David, thank you. This has been a great conversation. Turning off the fire now. Thank you so very much. And thank you everyone for participating. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you.